This morning, we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 4. Uh, you might not expect a Christmas passage in Galatians, but it's there, Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. And so I would invite you to open up your Bibles to Galatians 4. This morning, we're going to look at the incarnation of Jesus. Incarnation, when you think about that word, carne, meat, sort of the enfleshment of Jesus, Jesus coming as a human. And we're going to look at the implications of the incarnation. And then the next three weeks, we're going to look at once Jesus came, what was it that he did? What roles did he fulfill? And we're going to look at those three roles, prophet, priest, and king. So this morning, the incarnation, the next three weeks, how Jesus is our prophet, priest, and king. And so this morning, we'll read Galatians 4, just two verses, verses 4 and 5. So please read along with me. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Let's pray. Father God, this morning as we come before your word, I pray that you would speak to us through it, through your word read and preached. I pray that you would use me as your instrument, Lord, that you would speak to my heart just as to all of our hearts. Lord, that we would submit to your word as our authority and allow you to transform us through it by the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I've been told in life that I have perfect timing. And one example is I asked Megan to marry me Christmas night 2011 very romantic. Two weeks later, I moved to St. Louis and was uh, 12 hours away. And so we were engaged distance, and I spent a lot of time on the phone and on Skype, which might not sound that bad, but this was someone, is someone, who can't hold a five-minute phone conversation. And so, you know, it got to the point, I don't know what Megan would say, but I would say I got pretty good at holding a conversation for even hours on the phone. But as much as excitement as I had to talk to Megan on the phone or on a screen, I was never as excited as when I was driving on the way to the airport to pick her up. Megan came to visit me in St. Louis, and of course nothing was the same as having Megan there. Nothing replaces flesh, flesh and blood, having people present with us. Don't we know that this year? Right? Some of you might have had Zooms, Zooms giving right? and, and, and talking to people, which is great. And don't get me wrong, Zoom and FaceTime and so on and so forth, they're lifesavers during this pandemic. But I think we could all say it's not the same. Nothing replaces flesh. And flesh actually makes Christianity unique. In the realm of world religions, Christianity is Unique. John 1.14 says that the word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And that word for dwelt actually means to set up a tent. Set up a tent. God tented with humanity as he came. Other world religions are about how humans should try to escape this world, escape the flesh, the flesh is evil, escape this world and make it to heaven. But Christianity says God came to us in the flesh. John Murray, a theologian, says this about the incarnation. The thought of incarnation is stupendous. Great word, stupendous. For it means the conjunction in one person of all that belongs to Godhood and all that be Godhead and all that belongs to manhood. The conjunction in one person of God and man. And I think that we can make this watered down somewhat. We celebrate Christmas every year. We celebrate Advent every year, multiple weeks usually talking about Christmas. You know, you see movies or pictures or sing songs about this baby in a manger. And we can water it down, can't we? And forget that this baby was God, is God in the flesh. And the incarnation of Jesus is the turning point of history. We tell time this way, don't we? Before Christ, B.C., 
A.D., the year of our Lord, the turning point of history and a miracle. We'll see why the incarnation is a miracle, a gracious, life-giving, hope-securing miracle. So this morning, we're just going to look at three things, the when, the where, and the why of the incarnation. The when, the where, and the why. And so first is the when. We read, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. The fullness of time. Leon Morris uh, writes this about that word. He says, the noun fullness indicates here that God has been working his purpose throughout history. And it was only when the right time came that he sent his son. The fullness of time. It relates back to our prophet scandal, actually, which emphasizes the weight of waiting. We all know the weight of waiting, right? When you're waiting for something you really want, like an engagement, like Christmas. It's not even December yet. And I've already been asked by my son multiple times, are my presents tomorrow? Like, no, you still have a long time to wait. And I explained to him, the longer you wait, the more it makes it worth it, but that doesn't really get through a four-year-old's mind. So the weight of waiting, the weight of Adam and Eve in paradise, and yet rebelling against God, being banished. And as Megan already read, God's still promising one will come to crush the serpent's head. The weight of Israel, God's chosen people among the nations, and yet we know they just can never get their act straight. The weight of the prophets, the prophets calling and warning people, return to the Lord, repent of your sins, lest destruction come upon you. And yet even in the prophets, we see the day of the Lord, judgment is coming, but... It doesn't come without hope for those who are faithful. The weight of silence. Silence. Don't forget, between Malachi and Matthew, there's 400 years of silence. There's no word from God. There's no revelation. And people are waiting. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Why was it 2,000 years ago? Why was 2,000 years ago the right time? Some, uh, some scholars will point out that actually Rome made it the right time. There was a great peace in Rome at that time. There was a great road system that allowed the gospel to spread widely, quickly. Greek was spoken pretty much the whole known world, one language. So again, the gospel could spread quickly. Why was it 2,000 years ago? That might have had something to do with it. I'm not God. I can't read God's mind. The simple, frustrating answer is because God said it was the right time. Why? Well, because God said so. So we also have to think about it being the fullness of time. God, this idea that time didn't just sort of run out and it was like, all right, fine. It was an intentional decision. The fullness of time for God's people. Put yourself in the shoes of a faithful Jew at the time, one of God's people, faithfully trying to fulfill God's law. If you've ever read the Old Testament, you know there's Ten Commandments and a lot of other laws too. And in fact, not just that, but we know the Pharisees added more and more laws. So you're faithfully trying to fulfill God's law perfectly, would you feel defeated? You're living in a time, again, of silence where it feels like God hasn't spoken, God hasn't moved, nothing's happened in hundreds of years. Would you feel defeated? Living in an empire that lets you practice your religion. Yes, the Romans let you practice your religion as long as it didn't cause a stir. And as long as you didn't get in the way of their progress and their politics. Would you feel defeated? God, in his wisdom and sovereignty, had worked his plan through history, and the fullness of time had come. Rome might have had something to do with it, because certainly the gospel spread quickly, but more so, we could say, people's hearts 
were ready. People were longing for hope, longing to see the Messiah. And the fullness of time had come. So, do you feel defeated this morning? Do I feel defeated? Do we feel defeated? The high school and college student that's trying to live out their faith in an environment that ridicules Christians. Maybe you feel defeated, like you have no answer from God for your struggling or your pain. Maybe you feel defeated living in this cancel culture that seeks to eliminate often biblical values that we stand for. I think we probably often feel defeated too, just as a first century Jew would have. And John 1 says that when Jesus came, it was light, light breaking through the darkness, light breaking through the darkness. Jesus didn't come in 1800 in the deep south. When everyone was a Christian, everyone sang hymns, everyone read their Bibles, Jesus came in a day and age that was a lot like ours. Different, but similar. Jesus came knowing it was not going to be easy. A day and age like ours when we could say, and Jesus says, don't feel defeated. How, does it, how do we live as Christians in today's world? Curl up in a ball, right? Just sort of curl up in a ball until Jesus comes back or we die. No, it's actually a lot more challenging. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Light shone through the darkness, you now are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's probably easier to curl up in a ball than to be the light of the world. And make no mistake, Jesus knows and we know it's not easy. Jesus says in John 3, 19, light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light. Jesus is saying that. Jesus is still alive. Light has come and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. Make no mistake, Jesus knew the way is narrow. Many people love the darkness. The Bible makes it clear over and over again that what looks like defeat for God is often the fullness of time. What looks like defeat and silence is God's fullness of time. Nothing is outside of God's control. So the call is to be faithful, to continue faithfully, to be the light of the world, to let our good deeds shine before others. Because the incarnation shows us when? The fullness of time. What looked like defeat actually became the greatest turning point in history. And then we see, after the when, the where of the incarnation. The where. It says, God sent forth his son, born of woman. Where? Physically. We all know the answer, right? I hope you do. Bethlehem. Bethlehem. A real place. Sometimes, I, I don't know why, all of a sudden I think, like, there's an actual place on my GPS where I could go. And, you know, people try to make money saying this is the place and that's the, we don't, we don't, maybe not the exact place, but we can go where Jesus walked, where Jesus was born. It's a real physical place. God confined himself to one body in a real place. We know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem to a normal couple, a normal place. He lived a normal life, had a normal job as a carpenter, what an incredible story. Again, we might water it down because we hear it so often, but what kind of God would subject himself to what Jesus was, who Jesus was? John Murray again says this, it's humiliating enough for God, God Almighty, God the creator of all things, the Holy One, for God to become a fragile, finite human under the most ideal conditions. In other words, if God is going to become a human, that's humiliating enough. But at least he should be like the, the king, the richest ruler in the richest empire in the world. 
But, John Murray says, but think of his birth, of his life, of those he kept company with, of the way he died. Jesus came as a human, fully human. And that's actually vital to our faith. We see that in, in the early church. I won't get into all the details. But many of the early debates and the creeds were written to defend that Jesus was fully human and fully God. In Hebrews 2, we heard it earlier actually, says that it's important since therefore the children of God, us, share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. He had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might make propitiation for the sins of the people. It's vital that Jesus was human. To be our Savior, he had to be. And he was. He was physically born in Bethlehem. Where? Bethlehem. But we also see where spiritually Jesus was born. Born of woman, born under the law. Born under the law. By becoming human, Jesus subjected himself to God's law. That no one is outside God's law because God is king of kings and lord of lords, the creator of all things. And Jesus was born under the law as we all are. Jesus was born to a Jewish family. So not just the law, but specifically the Jewish law. Born under the law. The Jews had a problem, as we all do. No one had, no one would perfectly fulfill God's law. Jesus was spiritually human. Don't forget that, too. Physically human, yes, and spiritually human. The Shorter Catechism said he's, he took on a reasonable soul, i.e., he was spiritually human. Jesus was tempted. We know that, right? We know the story when Jesus is in the wilderness and Satan comes and, and tempts Jesus, and where Adam failed, Jesus says, no. That's always where we go, usually. But, and, and it's obviously one of these monumental moments. But don't forget, it wasn't just in the wilderness Jesus was tempted. It wasn't just once in his life. Jesus was human. Jesus was a teenage boy who had hormones. We have to think he had some kind of temptation. Right? Jesus was probably, I don't want this to sound sacrilegious, but annoyed by people around him, right? It might have been tempting for Jesus to say or do something uh, to people around him. Jesus was tempted, Hebrews 4.15 4, says, in every way, just as we are, yet, it's an important yet, right? In every way, yet, without sin. Jesus was born under the law. There's two kinds of track coaches in the world. I ran track. Ian Sneller, he, he can tell you this too. Two kinds of track coaches. The one who rides in the golf cart behind the runners, yelling, do better, go faster, right? And then the other who puts on the shoes and runs with the team, right? Showing them the way, encouraging them, suffering with them, Embodying that old phrase, right? I, I won't ask you to do anything I'm not willing to do myself. Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses, not in a patronizing, condescending way, like, oh, look at them. He can sympathize. Have you ever been hungry? Jesus was hungry. Have you ever been tired? Jesus was tired. Misunderstood? Check. Check mistreated check physical pain check his own people jesus own people wanted him to do more jesus is is now the time that you're gonna you're gonna bring your kingdom i.e is now the time you're gonna overthrow the romans jesus opponents wish he would just shut up already and yet jesus is emmanuel god with us God with us in sickness, in poverty, in mental anguish, in emotional turmoil, in spiritual struggles, in relational stress. God with us, 
not in a golf cart. It sounds funny, but isn't that so often how we and others think of God? Driving behind us, just yelling, do better, get your act together, come on. No, Jesus is God with us, alongside us, suffering with us and for us. Where was the incarnation? We know in Bethlehem and under the law. And then lastly, why? Born under the law, verse 5, it says, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Why? It's simple. Redemption and adoption. Redemption and adoption. Why did Jesus come? The Bible actually answers that in a lot of different ways. You can go to different passages. But one answer Jesus gives in Mark 10, verse 45, why did Jesus come? The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to die. And we see, theologically, we talk about the active and the passive obedience of Christ. So the active obedience is Jesus, like we said, perfectly fulfilling the law, actively being obedient, doing everything that the law required. And the passive obedience is then submitting to and undergoing the curse of the law, the punishment of the law, the consequences of sin, totally undeserved, passively taking it on, even though he was sinless. The work of Jesus really has two parts. It's maybe an oversimplification, but two parts. One, perfectly righteous, and two, taking the penalty for our sin. You can't have one without the other. Jesus died on a cross. That was not that unique, honestly. I say that all the time to the youth. Jesus dying on the cross was not unique. Now, it's a little bit, obviously it is, but we can't miss the fact that people all the time died on crosses. What was unique, of course, is that no one, before dying on the cross, was perfect. There was probably people dying on crosses that were innocent, wrongly convicted, but they weren't perfect before that. And certainly no one on the cross was God, the Word, become flesh. You can't have one without the other, and being perfect, Jesus became our substitute, taking the penalty for our sin, became our sacrifice, shedding his blood so that we could be forgiven, became our redeemer, redeemer, to redeem those under the law. That word redeem means to buy someone out of slavery, to buy someone back, to buy someone freedom. The problem of sin is so severe and the situation so hopeless don't lose this. It, it says something about us, right? That the problem was so severe and so hopeless that only God could come to intervene, to redeem us, to buy us back. Why did Jesus come? It was a rescue mission, to rescue us from sin. But it was more than just redemption. We see it was also a, a reunion, a reunion. I'm not a very emotional person, so I'm not really prone to, to tears often. But one thing that always gets me is those um, videos of uh, military personnel returning home and, like, being the umpire and taking their mask off or whatever. And um, our Routon family here had that experience a couple years ago at Citizens Bank Park when Rob returned from overseas and surprised the family. And there's just this feeling, right? It's just this feeling like, Everything's right again. Everything's the way it should be. We're back together. It's a reunion. Now, I'm not in the military, uh, and I haven't been overseas much, but I've heard it's easier than ever to communicate with home. I remember actually, I think, texting a few times with Rob when he was overseas. Right? It's easier than ever. But my guess is not a single one of them would say it's the same. It's not the same. Not the same as flesh. And Jesus came to reunite us. We see that in Christ, 
we have adoption. We're not just saved from something. We're not just saved from the penalty of sin, but we're saved to something. We're not just bought our freedom, but we're welcomed into God's family. In Genesis, we know God walked in the garden, walked in the garden. Of course, then sin enters the world, and after Genesis 3, there's warnings everywhere. Warning, warning, warning. Exodus 33, verse 20, you cannot see my face, God says, for man shall not see me and live. Ezekiel 1.8, Ezekiel says, such was the appearance of of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face. Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, is shown a vision of God's throne, and he says, woe is me. Woe is me, for I am undone. There's warnings everywhere. Because what we see is that sin is an unconquerable barrier between people and God. The tabernacle and the temple in the Old Testament make it clear there's a holy place with a massive curtain. No one can go in there. In fact, in Leviticus 10, we see two people go in there, not the way they should, and they're consumed by fire. God's holiness is not to be trifled with. Sin is an unconquerable barrier. And yet we know that God can conquer it. Unconquerable by us, but God in his love and his grace didn't leave it that way. Jesus brought a reunion. In Christ we are reunited, we are adopted back into God's family. It says as sons. Sons. Sorry, all you females. No, just kidding. That sounds sexist, right? It sounds very unmodern. But it's actually incredibly beautiful because uh, in that culture as you probably know women did not have many rights women couldn't inherit property they couldn't inherit wealth they didn't have many protections from the law and just before this in Galatians 3 Paul says there's no male or female he doesn't mean there's not male or female in the sense of gender but what he means is we are all one we're all equal And when it says that we are adopted as sons, he's saying, male or female, whoever believes in Christ is welcomed as a son of the king to inherit riches and blessings to be reunited to our father. I can't think of a reunion without thinking of Luke 15, when the prodigal son, as we know, has been off in a far country Living it up, YOLO, right? You only live once. He, he, he embodied that spirit and realized he was out of money. Think about what it would be like in his sandals, returning home with your tail between your legs, right? Lifting your eyes and seeing your father running, shamelessly running. Now we know the end, but think about if you were in there, shamelessly running, and you're probably thinking, uh-oh, this is going to be worse than I thought. He's running towards me, bracing for a beating, right? And you receive an embrace, expecting to work years to pay off your debt. And he puts the robe on you, the plushest robe, gives you the family ring, trying to avoid the glances from your family and your neighbors. And then you find yourself the guest of honor at a welcome home party. Jesus came so that we might be redeemed and adopted, reunited to our true and our loving Father. Why? We see it right here, the beauty of the gospel. And so these two verses show us the when, the where, and the why of the incarnation. And they're all vital to our faith. But we can't end without also seeing the challenge, the challenge that the incarnation presents to us. Because Christmas is not just a history lesson. The incarnation of Jesus speaks to our mission and our purpose right now. 2,000 years later, 
It still shows us who we are, why we're here. The body of Christ is no longer with us, physically, right? Present. We can't hold Jesus the way Mary held Jesus. We can't touch Jesus the way Thomas did after the resurrection. Jesus no longer walks the earth. The body of Christ is not here, but Paul says, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 17, Now you, church, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Jesus says in John 20, verse 21, As the Father has sent me, God sent forth his Son, we read. Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, even so, I am sending you. We can't miss the challenge. You are the body of Christ. You are the sent ones of God. When others see you, do they see sacrificial love? Do they see conviction for the truth? Do they see unflinching hope in the future? Do they see care and generosity for the least and the last and the lost? Do they see contentment, knowing who you are and why you're here? When others see you, do they see Jesus? Do they see Jesus? Now, I'm not Jesus. You're not Jesus. We know that whatever people see in us, it's going to be far from perfect. And yet we see we are adopted into a family. And like any family, we should bear some resemblance of our family, of our father, of our brother, Jesus. God came. God came in the flesh, dwelt among us. The body of Christ was broken for us. And now Jesus says, you are my body. We're sent out to show others the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. We're sent out as Christ was to be broken on behalf of others, to be broken on behalf of God's kingdom, and yet to know The glory of God is what it's all about. To be welcomed and to be told, well done, good and faithful servant. Wouldn't that be an incredible word to hear? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you, humbly thank you. Lord, that you came to our rescue. Lord, to redeem us from our sins, to save us from the penalty we deserve, and yet also to save us into your family. Lord, if we're honest, so often we don't bear resemblance to your truth. We don't bear resemblance to Christ. We're called to imitate Christ, and so often we imitate the world around us. We live for our own glory. Father, I pray that you would forgive us and strengthen us. Lord, never let us overlook the beauty of your grace and love and mercy shown in the incarnation. And yet, Father, don't let us just leave it back 2,000 years ago, but remind us, Lord, that you give us a calling to live as a part of your body, to be sent out by you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.